Hello and welcome to One on One. I'm Vernon Ramasar and I'm very pleased to say my guest today is Dr. John Varallo, who's the Senior Technical Advisor for Japaigo, an affiliate of Johns Hopkins University. Welcome to the program. Yeah, thank you, Fran. Thank you very much for being here. Yeah, um, you're here you. as a guest of the Family Planning Association of Trinidad yes, and Tobago. Yeah. We should give them a little credit for that for bringing <laughs> you in. Right, yeah. And you've previously done some training locally with a couple of nurses, is it, or a couple of yeah, people good, yeah. mm -hmm. um, on cervical cancer screening in um, using visual inspection with acetic acid. Um, this is obviously sounds like a very technical field, a very medical field, <laughs> but to put it in perspective, obviously there are, it is currently screening for cervical cancer. Um, it, it, other than this type of screening, what, what is a normal procedure that women would undergo now? Yeah, so um, historically, uh, a cervical cancer screening has been performed using uh, what we call pap smear. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that's had good success in uh, richer, more developed countries. You know, it was introduced in like the 1950s. And since that time, we've seen a dramatic reduction of over 70% uh, in uh, cervical cancer incidence and mortality rates in those countries. But unfortunately, we haven't been able to replicate that success in, uh, in other countries. That because are, of the costs associated? Well, it, there's costs, there's logistics, um, infrastructure. There's a lot of different uh, barriers to, to that success. And so the visual inspection with acetic acid or, or the VIA is an alternative approach. Uh, to cervical cancer screening that has been shown to work uh, in, in many, many different uh, types of settings. Now, obviously, I'm not a woman, so I had to do a little research in this. <laughs> in, in speaking to some women I, I work with and asking them about <coughs> cervical cancer screening, they said they'd undergone it, and mm -hmm. it's not a very pleasant procedure. And I said, well, what do you think about this? And I was showing them this thing, and they said, that actually might be less unpleasant. <clears throat> um, I don't know. I mean, that's uh, it's unfortunate. We might never know. Yeah. Well, it's unfortunate yeah. to hear that that it's not uh, that's such an unpleasant experience because it should not be. But apparently, there's a probe involved. Well, been, there's yeah. there's a speculum that's okay. uh, that's involved that uh, allows uh, the provider to visualize the cervix, um, and that's part of the training. You know, the training isn't just to look at the cervix, but it's also to examine the entire woman, right? Uh, to have the, to have a conversation with the woman, to inform and educate. A woman, so that she can make an informed decision about what what's occurring, and to do a proper examination. So it should not be uh, so unpleasant. It's not going to be pleasant, but it shouldn't be something that prevents someone from from seeking services. Um, but that being said, the 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 initial part of the examination is very similar to a Pap smear, but unlike with a Pap smear, what happens is that there's um, a scraping of cells from the mm -hmm. cervix. You put it on a slide. It goes to a pathologist. Wait for the results to come back, and you know maybe you get the results you know back, and then you um, there's, so we're a, there's days a time. Or weeks. Yeah. yeah, it could be, and and in some cases um, months. Uh, depends on the setting. You know, some cases months. Sometimes you never even get the results. The VIA, you get the results right away. After you because clean it's it, a visual inspection. Visual technique. inspection. Right. You put uh, a uh, white vinegar solution on the cervix, just what, clean in the cervix, and there's a chemical reaction that occurs um, if there's a precancerous lesion present, and you get the result in one minute. Now, in terms of the effectiveness of this method of screening versus the more traditional one or the more established one, I guess, are they co comparable? Yeah, I mean, and that's the the beauty of it. Um, there's a couple of things that are <laughs> that are the beauty of it, but um, you know, what uh, that's one of the myths associated with VIA is that uh, because it's relatively simple and low tech, that it's not uh, it's not accurate. And we have a wealth of uh, evidence that shows that it's as accurate, if not more so, than, really? than the Pap smear. Yeah. Now that now now that, that comes with a caveat is that you have to have proper training in this, right? So you can't just say read a book and you know you can go ahead and do a VIA or do an interview with somebody. Who knows about it. <laughs> right, yes. right. But uh, so you have to have the proper training that's associated with it, and so the, and you will um, you know, provide accuracy as good, if not better, than than the Pap smear, and that that's been shown. So it's uh, highly accurate and in low resource environments. Yeah, which makes it obviously ideal for developing world countries. Yeah, yeah. Which is why I guess one of the reasons that you're here is because I, is it being used throughout the region as well, or? Yeah, and so that's what the um, International Planned Parenthood Federation and also PAHO um, uh, is doing is trying to uh, to scale up cervical cancer prevention services, because uh, still, even though there's been some progress uh, made uh, in the in the Caribbean, um, 
it's kind of stalled and it really not making the progress that, that we need to. And there is some infrastructure um, for uh, kind of the uh, historically based pap smears or cytology based uh, screening programs. Um, but uh, we haven't uh, had as much of an impact as we should, you know, at this point. And so it's not saying that VIA is replacing pap smear. It's in, especially in, in Trinidad, in, in mm. Tobago, it's to complement what's already here. Because you have good, good services, right? There's providing, you know, uh, quality services, but you need to be able to reach a wider... Uh, uh, because even the quality services are sort of limited to certain areas of the exactly, country, whereas exactly. in rural areas, exactly. somebody can actually do screening there and get the results immediately. Exactly. And, and that's, that's where, the, where VIA really fits in very nicely with, um, with a country like Trinidad and Tobago, where you maybe in urban areas, there's decent coverage, uh, but the, with VIA and cryotherapy, it's very amenable to outreaches. And with the VIA, because there's, no, there's very little infrastructure that you need. So we, when you're doing it, you do need a speculum to see the cervix. Right. All you need is some vinegar. You need a, a what? You need a light, a bright white light, um, and doesn't need to be. Are we talking like going into the supermarket, picking up vinegar off the shelf kind yes, of vinegar? Yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. Yes, right. yes. As long as it's five percent. So it's not highly overpriced medical no, vinegar. No, no, no. And uh, and you need a nice bright white light. So you can even just, just a torch light. Um, and for the so that's the screening part. And so what the important thing of this is that we're not just talking about VIA, right? Because you can have the best screening test in the world. 100% accurate, but if you don't link that with treatment, mm -hmm. then it's not worth anything because you're just screening. But, and what, what, you, what the VIA allows is that because you get that result right away, you can link it with treatment in that same visit, that same exact visit. You don't have to go away to have results to come back. You can be treated right then and there. And we train the nurses to be able to do the screening and the treatment. And the now treat you mentioned cryotherapy earlier. Um, how does that fit into it? Right, so that's and the treatment. And what is it in the first place? <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so cryotherapy is the treatment part of it. So VIA is a screening, just like the pap smear, and now the uh, cryotherapy is a treatment. And cryotherapy is simply, it's a freezing technique. Mm -hmm. And what we do is um, uh, there's a specialized uh, instrument that takes gas, carbon dioxide gas, from a tank. Um, cylinder goes through a tubing to a probe, metal probe that is placed on the cervix. And uh, the freezing technique takes, uh, it's three minutes of freezing. So you create like an ice ball on, on the cervix. So you're actually um, freezing the cervix, wait for five minutes, and then freeze again for three minutes. So what we call a double freeze technique. Now, what's nice about this is, well, again, you don't need electricity. Um, the, you don't need anesthesia, right? So you don't need to be hospitalized for this. You don't need an, an, any anesthesia. A uh, woman may have some cramping associated with it during the time of the, the procedure. Um, and it's very effective. You know, and we, you don't need a surgeon, I guess, as well. No, you, you have nurses, nurses and midwives that, that do this. And actually, in most of our countries, and being a doctor, um, you know, I understand it's, there's some doctors have some egos mm -hmm. about it, and they think that only they, can do, <laughs> only they can do certain procedures. But we have found that the best um, providers are actually the nurses, nurses and midwives. And, but and I would imagine women would feel more comfortable with the nurse or midwife as exactly, well. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Because so, they're, you know, it doesn't mean that the doctors can't do it. They do perfectly well, but they're also very busy with other, mm -hmm. uh, other services. And so they're often used in more consultative uh, um, approach uh, for the program. And so the frontline providers are the nurses and midwives, and uh, it works very well, uh, both in a clinic setting and also for outreaches. So, so when you actually t undergo one of these tests here, the uh, visual inspection with acetic acid, what is it actually sh telling you? Is it, is it saying there's precancerous activity going on, there is cancerous activity going on? What, what, what are you actually revealing? So what you're doing is, so when you look at the, the, the cervix, um, you have uh, two distinct areas on the cervix um, that are slightly different colors, pink and uh, lighter pink and, and darker pink. And I can show you sure. on this <laughs> if you want. Put, a, um, put up the warning on the screen. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I want to hold it a little higher because it's not sure. Yeah, there you okay. go. Yeah. So here, I'll probably point to the wrong area. So this is the, a typical looking cervix, okay? And so this lighter pink area, 
this is a healthy. This is healthy. Right. This is a normal looking cervix. Okay. This is before you put the vinegar on. Okay. Okay. Um, and so you see this lighter pink and then this darker pink area. And where they, they meet is a special kind of anatomical area where uh, most of the precancer is going to occur. Okay. okay. And so if you put the vinegar on this, now what happens is that um, if it's a normal healthy cervix, it looks exactly the same. No so it changes. doesn't change aspect at all? It doesn't change at all. Okay. okay? Now, and the reason why it, it's pink is that, uh, and you're looking at it with the light, is that the light is passing through to the uh, vascular area underneath the underlying stroma. It has, you know, blood vessels are in it, so it look, looks that way. Now, if you have a precancerous lesion uh, in this area, after you put the vinegar on, in a minute, it takes about a minute, it'll turn white. Okay, because it's a chemical, chemical reaction of some Exactly. Sort. What it's doing is it's coagulating protein that, that okay. are in the cells. And so what, that coagulation blocks the light from going in and bounces back. And I think you've got a, another example of that. Right. Which is a completely different looking yeah. situation going on there. Right. And so this is, you know, this is, the, this cervix looked perfectly pink before the vinegar. You put the vinegar on and that's the white patch right there. So right. the cancer activity is, is releasing some sort of proteins that are reacting with the vinegar, coagulating because of the vinegar. Yeah, so when you have, have pre-cancer, okay, so this isn't cancer. Pre -cancer. So pre-cancer, right. um, the uh, nucleus in the cell, without getting you know, too, too much into it, has, yeah, yeah. has, uh, has more protein in it, okay. right? So normal cells have less protein, pre-cancer cells have more protein. And so the protein temporarily coagulates from the vinegar. And so it, it blocks the light from, from uh, getting... So it's it, as simple as that? Yeah. It's, it's almost like a red light indicator, there's something going on yeah. here. At, at, at that point, if, if you see this, this reaction taking place, what's the next step? So the next step is the, is the treatment. So for, for, for uh, so cryotherapy, right? And so now what you can do, and if that lesion, for this one, this, was, um, this is fairly small. Mm -hmm. And so a, uh, a specialized probe uh, can... Uh, be placed on the cervix and you deliver the carbon dioxide gas to it and that freezes the cervix. So what will happen is that now this cervix will freeze. You do a double freeze technique. So three minutes freeze, wait five minutes and then freeze again. And that will uh, get rid of the precancerous lesions. And does it do anything to the healthy cells? It, it does to, uh, to a slight degree, but just show... Oh, you came fully equipped. Yeah. You? yeah. So this is the... Um, let me hold it up. That's after the, the freezing, okay? All right, so immediately after, right? Right, right. So that's the, the ice ball that, that forms right. from it. And, um, and what we have found is that the, uh, the cure rate following this, so one year follow-up, in the literature you'll see about 90% cure rates, which is quite good. That's remarkable, yeah. Yeah, in our, in our programs we're actually finding that it's closer to 95%. Um, so, you know, part of it is making sure that you select the lesions correctly. So you don't want it too large because the tip has to mm -hmm. cover it completely. Um, and you need to see the full extent of it and you need to perform the, the technique correctly. Well, there be some cases where you, you go and perform the test, but it's already, the person already has cervical cancer. Right. And this obviously would be a whole no, different scenario exactly, you're talking about. Exactly, yeah. And that's, uh, and that's a very unfortunate case. Because if you look at the natural history of cancer, so, uh, so Cancer is caused by the HPV infection, mm -hmm. human papillomavirus. Um, it's very common uh, in virus, but most, fortunately, mo uh, is that in all cases or in most cases? No, it's it's always caused. Always caused by okay. by, by uh, HPV, uh, or 99.7 percent of cancer cases are associated with HPV. But HPV infection is very common, sexually transmitted infection, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the, Remarkably uh, common, actually. Yeah, it's yeah. about like 30 to 80% lifetime risk of having it. But fortunately, a normal healthy system can uh, clear the virus, right? And so the infection goes away, and you don't have any concerns about cervical precancer or cancer. But persistent HPV infection can turn into precancer. And then from precancer, you go through what we you can say mild, moderate, severe dysplasia. So these th three stages until you get, get to cancer. And what timeline are we talking about? But at least 10 years, in so general. So if you get screened even every couple of years, it would be spotted yeah. before it gets cancerous. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so um, the different scenario would be uh, women who are living with HIV. 
So they're uh, immunocompromised. Yeah. Right, and so their immune system is suppressed, and so they don't uh, fight off the infection as well, and, they, and there's probably more rapid progression uh, through the precancer stage. So you have this long window of being screened, being able to screen, uh, you know, detect and tr treat precancer. So it's almost, there's almost no reason for a woman to die from cervical cancer. And yet it, women do die of I cervical know, cancer. I know, I and, know. And that's, how, how prevalent that's, is it, is cervical cancer, in terms of, of the female population? Well, it's the second leading cause of uh, cancer deaths well, uh, in women in, in Trinidad. After breast in cancer, is it? Or? Yeah. So it's a very serious business. It's and, very but as serious. you mentioned, it's an unusual cancer because there are, there's a vaccine that will prevent infection eventually with, from the HPV exposure. And there's also now a relatively, well, a very inexpensive and effective treatment. Right. So really, as you mentioned, there's no excuse. No, there's no, no excuse. No woman should die from cervical cancer. Um, and, and part of it is uh, lack of access to appropriate services. And so, uh, and every country struggles with this in, in one way or, or another. And so it's trying to look at, well, what, how can we, uh, you know, how can we improve that? How can we improve access to, to services? Um, instead of screening the same, you know, the same women over and over again, mm -hmm. then you know, we, we need to broaden the coverage and to really have a public- And take the coverage to them, I guess, in Exactly, cases, yeah, 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 so bringing it to the community. And that's what we've learned in um, many countries, like uh, a country where I was working a lot uh, before uh, coming here is Guyana. And uh, we actually helped establish a, a national program there, VIA-based, and because they weren't really doing much in the way of, way of pap smears, and uh, and Guyana, is, it's you know lots of very remote uh, areas, mm -hmm. and we would do. We would take our small tank of carbon dioxide gas, put it in a boat, we go up rivers. You take it to the community, and it's easy to do, and the uh, and the women love it. You know, if you bring the services there, the women will access the services. You know, and so it's, it truly is taking it to, to the community. How often should a woman get uh, go for a test and have the examination? Yeah, so... Does it so depend on age? Or, or uh, not, not so much age. So, well, there is an age, kind of a target age range. Um, is there a sexual activity range as well? Not, not so much. Because um, of the long duration? Right, of exactly. Okay. And so, and yeah, I can't really speak to what the guidelines are in, in Trinidad, but in general, so I'll take like the, the World Health Organization, sure. okay? So their recommendation is screening between uh, target, priority at targeting between ages of 30 and 49, okay? But depending on what your local cancer epidemiology is, then you may need to shift that down to a slightly younger age at like 25, okay? So 25 to 49 or even a little bit above um, is, should be where you prioritize your resource. So you'd rather screen all of those women at least once and try to get at least 80% coverage uh, of that population than screening a smaller segment of the population, you know, eight times you know, and you're only covering 10% of your, your population. I, I think Trinidad is an interesting case, Trinidad and Tobago, because um, not, not too long ago the government introduced the HPV vaccine as mm. free, which I think is the most commendable mm -hmm. yeah, effort. Yeah. But in, in speaking to women that I know, and I guess some guys as well, almost nobody has gone for it. Mm. And we're talking about a very expensive drug that's being administered for free, I guess two doses of it. I mean, why are people so reluctant to take charge of their own health? Um, well, I, I don't know. I don't know if I can I speak to that, that, particular, that yeah. particular context, but um, y you're right that the the vaccine is a, uh, a, a um, potentially has uh, a can have a significant impact this on is the Gardasil on, and the other one, which is, yeah, 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 yeah uh, Cervarex and uh, yes, Gardasil, right. um, and uh, there's there's a, a, a number of issues that surround. Uh, why people don't access the services. Uh, some of it can be what we've seen in other countries. I'm not, not going to speak mm -hmm. to here, but what we've seen in other countries sometimes is that the information that was put out uh, wasn't um, as clear as it could be. Um, and so it uh, created some, again, some myths and some, uh, some concerns. Uh, in some cases, there was, uh, their populations thought that they were being sterilized. Um, or they were no, yeah, in some countries. Yeah, yeah they were. Yeah. they concerned about the safety of uh, the vaccine, that it was experimental. So there's well, a they lot. Well, just didn't believe the, the connection between a virus and cancer. Right, right. And I'll uh, take you know take the U.S. You know, we're, uh, where we think that we should With be able wonderful to. Wonderful measles outbreaks. And, uh, <laughs> right, right. Well, even uh, our uh, vaccination, HPV vaccination, has is, is been poor. And part of that is it's very political. 
uh, because of the thought that it could uh, encourage uh, sexual activity and things Which like that. Which is no indication of whatsoever. No, 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 not at all, not at all. So, I mean, it, so some of it is messaging um, and uh, just putting out the proper information. But the, in, the, uh, what's important about that also is that you know, if you use the vaccine, let's say that you, in the best case scenario that um, vaccine is introduced well, it's a high uptake, mm -hmm. uh, girls are being, uh, being vaccinated, that's great for the future, but you're talking maybe, no. you're not going to have an impact for 30 right. years from now, but there's plenty of women right now who have cervical precancer that we need to identify and treat. And so they, it shouldn't be looked as like competing uh, uh, programs. They should be linked together, intricately linked together. one of the long term, as you mentioned, we're looking to the country's medical expenses long term and saying, listen, we better invest in this now than pay for cervical cancer treatment 20, 30 years down the line. And the other one is something that needs to be done right away. Right, right. And so, so, you, inv so there should be, um, so you should be targeting uh, both groups, right? And, and the messaging should be the same. You know, for example, in, in some countries, we've even done what we call the mother-daughter initiative, mm -hmm. where the mother comes in for, for screening and the daughter uh, receives a vaccination. So the messaging is, oh, that's is clever, similar. Actually. Yeah. So you're covering both at the same right. time. Right, exactly. Yeah. Now, I, I, I have a sort of strange mind. So I'm just wondering <laughs> this test, who and when did they come up with it? It's sort of an odd thing. Who first thought, what if we put vinegar and see what happens? I mean, how, I know. How, it must have been some you know, uh, accident. Intrepid <laughs> person. Some accident that happened. I don't, honestly, I don't know. But it's been around for a long time. Oh, it has? Yeah. Okay. And the thing is what. Um, so, uh, and a lot of countries also do what's called colposcopy. Have you heard of that? No, I haven't actually. So that's uh, another thing that's uh, linked with pap smears. So the, the traditional steps for a pap smear is that you have the screening done. If it's positive, say it's precancerous, then the next step is that you go for colposcopy and biopsy. And colposcopy is put vinegar on the cervix, but you're using magnification. Okay. All right, you're using a, what we call a colposcope, so it magnifies things. Um, and then you do a biopsy, then a biopsy goes to the pathologist, they have to read the results, and they come back, you say what, what the, uh, what the so result it's, it's is. adding extra steps. It's, it's multiple steps. What, so why would you even undergo that? Well, the, uh, the advantage of it is that it will increase your accuracy okay. if, you ha if you have good recall, right? So the, the woman has to be able to come back for those services. Right. Oh, okay. So, I mean, what we have found is that at each step that you add to a service, there's about a 25 to 50 percent dropout rate. People just don't bother to come back. Not bother. The they, they may not be able to. Right. Oh, that's true. Yeah. You know, and so, money involved traveling. Yeah. And things like I mean, that. It's, yeah. there's there's financial aspects to it. There's time, travel, family, so many things. And, you know, the, the woman always puts her health at last. It's everyone else in the family goes first. And so she's much less likely to come in for services. So that's why you need the single visit approach. I mean, you don't need, you know, in the ideal world where you're, you, have the, the, you have access to these types of services, you have pathologists that can read it, you get the results back quickly and someone can come in anytime and you have good, good uh, recall, then yes, you, you can do it that way, right? But what we found is that by trying to replicate that in other settings where you don't have the resources, it has not worked. It's been, it's been a failure. And so what can we do that, um, that can address that? You know, we're not trying to find the, the perfect solution. We're trying to find the best solution for that the most that, efficient, that I guess, yeah. in that context. Right. We have about a minute and a half left. I, this is your follow-up visit. So I have to ask you, How's the follow-up been? I mean, has the uptake been good in terms of? Well, we're, no, we're going to find out because starting, uh, so today is just the kind of prep day, making sure that everything is in place. Mm -hmm. And uh, on Thursday and Friday, uh, Family Planning Association is launching the services. So, uh, so Thursday is going to be uh, the uh, free screening and, and treatments uh, at their uh, clinic. And then Friday, we're doing, uh, doing an outreach. And so we're, and we're going to, I'm going to be working with the two nurses that were trained in Belize in, in January. Is there any plan to train more nurses in it? Because it seems like such a, a, a useful that, tool. That's, that's yeah. what we're talking about. That's what right. we're hoping for. You know, and, and you're right. And, and this is, we're hoping that this is the first step into uh, establishing uh, um, a, a center 
here essentially you know so uh, train more nurses here you can even uh, what, just like what we replicated or what we did in uh, Guyana is that we developed um, a, uh, a center of excellence you we started doing training we, we trained uh, providers to become trainers so they do their own training and uh, become the national program and that's where we did the first training was it was in Guyana using the, uh, those providers that we trained to be trainers in VIA and cryotherapy. So it helps build capacity with, within, the, within the country. I mean, I would love to come back every time for it, but ultimately that's not the best way of going about it. Well, we're, we're glad you like coming, though. That, that's, <laughs> that's always good. Well, Dr. Varela, we're out of time. Um, I'm glad you're here from JPEGO, and, uh, and the work sounds amazing and interesting, and I hope people will learn more as Family Planning Association of Trinidad Tobago spreads the word about this uh, yeah. really innovative um, new way of screening for, for cervical cancer. Yeah. A great pleasure. All right, yeah. Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much yeah. for being Thank here. You. You've been watching One on One. Join us again tomorrow for another edition.